Good evening. This is Wednesday, September 14th. Okay, now I have no idea what I just did. Um, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. We're in the book of John. We've been going through the book of John for a couple months now. We're on John chapter 8. We started it last... No, John chapter 9. Oh, boo. Oh, well. Anyway, we're on John chapter 9. We started John chapter 9 last week when the um, Jesus and the disciples approached a man who had been born blind, and their question was, is this something that happened at birth? Uh, did he sin? Or Because somebody must have sinned. We know there was sin involved. For this man to be born blind, was it his parents to sin? And it was passed unto him as the part of the curse? Or did he sin in the womb? Somewhere somebody must have sinned. We're not stupid. We know somebody sinned. Well, Jesus says, maybe you are stupid, because neither he sinned nor his parents. That's not why this has happened. And and it actually be a waste of time to put yourself in the place of God. God knows what the things were that brought this about. Not our concern. Our concern is the healing. Um, and so let's stop having an intellectual discussion and let's let's go about healing the guy. So uh, we were talking about that last week, and um, now we're going to continue on to see what did they actually do. Okay, so John chapter 9, I'm just so to refresh our minds, our thoughts. Uh, now, as Jesus passed by, John chapter 9, verse 1, he saw a man who was born blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. We, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because the night is coming when no man can work. So I can either spend a lot of time discussing why this happened, or we can go about uh, healing him. So, he says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Hey, Rodney, thank you for writing a comment. Now I know that I'm actually broadcasting other than just to my wife, who's so nice that she sits here and listens to these all the time. I know that there are other people out there who are hearing it. So we're continuing from there. So as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Okay, so now he's going to go about healing. I want to examine two other times that Jesus healed someone who was blind, how he did it then, and discuss why is he doing a different thing now? Why doesn't he do the same thing then? Doesn't God always do the exact same thing? No. But we try to make him do the exact same. This is how you did it last time, God, so we're going to program our service, or I'm going to say the exact same words, just so that you can do it again, because if, we, if it's different, you'll get lost and confused, because you know how you are, God. You just love habit. So, but that's not actually the God we serve. The God we serve does things differently all the time. So I don't know why we try to program God into it. It's got to go exactly like this. Okay, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, it says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind man came to him, and Jesus said to them, so he went into the house. Now, we this is interesting. Jesus needs to see, are you committed to this, or is this, are you just tossing this out there? Have mercy on me, and then you've been distracted and go. So he made them follow him, <laughs> just because they're blind, but apparently they were able to do that, into the house. So they came in the house too. It's like, okay, now I know that you're not just, Toss and dice to see. I wonder what's going to happen today if I say this. You are serious about this. Okay. So when he came into the house, the blind man came into him, and Jesus said to them, Now, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Sometimes I've seen people come forward to have hands laid them for healing, and they're crying, and they're because they don't think God can do it. I'm standing on this line, but this is not going to work. It's not going to work. I don't know why I'm even up here. And so God's like, well, that's not, that's not really actually faith. And I really enjoy faith. Sometimes God doesn't need us to have faith. He's just going to do a miracle, uh, a sovereign act on his part. That's a thing. But most of the time, 
he wants us to at least believe he can do it. Uh, so do you believe, I need you to believe in this, for this to work in this instance. Do you believe? They said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, well, according to your faith, let it be to you. Since you believe this can happen, it will. In this instance, that's what we was required. He just touched their eyes. It says, and their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one knows it, though. Don't tell anybody. Now, people were going to notice. Jesus knows people are going to notice. When they go home and they weren't tripping over everything, like, what happened to you? Nothing. So people are going to notice. What he was telling them is, don't broadcast this immediately because there were things that Jesus had to do. And people were going to form a big crowd and rush after Jesus. And uh, Jesus had this thing about people only wanting him for the miracles and not understanding that he was there as the sacrifice for their sin. Um, you need to, it's okay that you were fed, like when he fed the 5,000, but you only like the food. You're not understanding that you're sinners, that I'm going to die for your sins, because that's going to, I'm interested in your eternal salvation not just your immediate. Not ju it's not like he's not interested in the immediate, the immediate. God wants to feed and wants to heal and do all those things. But if that's all you see him for, then you're going to miss out on your eternal salvation. Because when you get to heaven, you're going to get new eyes and a new body and all, new everything. And so God's like, if you never get to heaven, though, none of this is going to make any difference. So don't tell anybody that's going to cause a big rush because I need to be preaching. People need to be hearing my words. It's very understanding. But it says when they departed, they spread the news about him in all the country that he was in there. This is when he's farther up east. This is part of the reason why Jesus came down separately uh, by himself, because there's specific people that he was called to that he wouldn't even be able to get to if there was all these big crowds around him. Okay, Matthew chapter 20. So in that instance, again, he just asked, do you believe? And then he touched their eyes instant. There's a different instance. Matthew chapter 20, verse 29. It says, now as they went out of Jericho, again, so they're, they're east and, and north of Jerusalem. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Oh, of course they did. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, because obviously people were saying, oh, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, right? They cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Again, they're using the son of David because... That was part of what the son of David was going to do. He was going to open blind eyes. So if you're the son of David, do what the Bible said you would do. Then the multitude warned them lest they should be, uh, that they should be quiet, which is crazy. Like, shh, don't buy. That's, you're out of order. That's not what the program, that's not what's next. We have offering. Then we got two songs. Then we're going to have a healing line. Don't you, don't you come get out of order? Like, why should they not ask for healing? Shh, don't bother him. Because they had no clue why Jesus was there. Sometimes our program is so full of so many other things. We're not clear why God is there. And we save a lot of the good stuff for the end or we forget about it. I've got all these other things on our program. It's like, Jesus is like, what are you doing? I'm here to heal. Hello? Okay. So the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more because it's like, forget you. Saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? Be specific. That doesn't mean you have to always be specific. Whatever you pray, you must be specific or God doesn't. In this instant, with these people, God did not say, Jesus did not go to everybody and say, be specific. Just in them. What, what, have mercy. That's, do you think I can heal your eyes? Because you may be saying, have mercy and throw us some money or some clothes or find us some shelter. So I need you to ask for what you want, okay? What do you want that I do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion, he touched their eyes, and immediately their eyesight, their eyes received sight, and they got up and followed him. All he did was touch them. But he did have to, in each case, he asked them a question, right? What do you want? Or in this case, I want you to be specific what you want. In the other case, do you believe? Because you have to not believe that I can, but that I actually will do it. In some cases, it's, it's not just do you believe that I am willing, but do you think that I can do it? So there, there are both things happening, right? 
sometimes people believe, oh, God can do anything. They just don't think he is going to. Sometimes they think, God, I know God wants to do this, but this is too big for God. Right? It helps when both things are in line. I know he's able and I know he's willing. I know he wants to. And so God was, Jesus was making them both things line up in those cases. Okay? Now, here he is with this blind man. Let's see if he asks the blind man a question. Let's see if he just touches his eyes and there's instant. John chapter 9. See, I'm mad at myself that I put 8. John chapter 9, verse 6. And when he had said these things to the disciples, like, it doesn't matter. I'm just here to, did he say anything to the man? No. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva. Let's talk about that, okay? Because there's a couple of things going on. First of all, they actually believed that human saliva could heal. Why? Because of centuries of experience and experimenting, uh, they, listen, there's some Pakistani doctors who did some experiments on some rabbits who had these wounds, and um, some of them they gave the normal cure to, some of them they did nothing to, and others they used saliva. Like every two hours they put saliva on these wounds. The ones that they put saliva on got healed. Their wounds healed faster. And so they published this report, and, and scientists went out and did this report, and it turns out that healthy human saliva does possess antimicrobial as well as certain healing properties and that there's this histatin protein in it that actually speeds up healing. So the ancients would, would use saliva on different wounds and stuff like that. Your mama might even spit in a little handkerchief and, and use saliva to probably just mostly to wipe off mud and dust but but that's like a thing right so it's a real thing so in their day but they had never used saliva on blind eyes when somebody had at when it was congenital when they've been born blind they had never used that's like no that can't be healed but so jesus is taking an, a common remedy which is good because sometimes people go should i go to the doctor is that does that mean lack of faith no if god leads you to go to the doctor sometimes god's going to take that common remedy and then add the supernatural to it. So that doesn't mean you don't go to the doctor. If God leads you to go, if God says, don't go to the doctor, I'm just going to heal you, then don't go. If God, if God but he, he let him say that to you. Don't just assume, I'm not supposed to go to the doctor. In this case, Jesus is using a regular remedy. He's going to add the supernatural to it, right? Uh, so you, you have to have a personal relationship with God to decide about your body. That's a thing. Okay. So, Mark chapter 7, this is other times that they used, Jesus used saliva, okay? He's done it, he did it two other times. And Mark chapter 7, verse 32, it says, Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, right? So he was deaf and his tongue was tied, right? Okay. And they begged him to put his hand on him. Because they, we saw you touch the blind people, so just touch them, okay? And he took him aside from the multitude, because some people in the multitude were believers and others were there just to see what could happen and they were not believers. And let me take you to the side so I can quiet you. And sometimes we have to just get away from the crowd so God can quiet our brain and he can talk to us. Take him aside from the multitude and he put his fingers in his ears. So Jesus put his fingers in the guy's ears and then he spat and he touched his tongue. So he spat in his fingers, then he touched the guy's tongue with his saliva. But Jesus is saliva. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed. So he's waiting for instruction from, that's what God led him to do. God said, do this. And he said to him, Ephrathratha, which means be opened. Right, okay. And immediately his ears were opened. So he could, because all he did was stick the fingers in. And the saliva on the tongue, uh, okay, it says, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Because that's how we are. God, sometimes God wants to keep something to itself, and there's a reason for it. It actually impeded the healing of others because there was, because again, the crowds were gathering just like it was a circus. Like at an accident. Somebody has an accident on the freeway and the cars are slowing down. They're not there to help. They're not slowing down. 
so that they can render assistance. They're just slowing down to see what's going on, and they're causing a traffic jam, and now this somebody's late to work because everybody's just slowing down to see the accident. So it's the same sort of this crowd was going to be around Jesus, not because there's nobody in that crowd that wanted anything from Jesus. You just want to see. And so somebody who really wanted something was going to have trouble getting to Jesus. This is why he's saying, don't tell anybody. So they're actually, this person who's all excited is actually slowing down the healing of somebody else. So sometimes God will tell us to do something we don't understand. Just keep that to yourself for a while. I don't know why. Why can't I tell everybody? Just trust me. We don't trust God. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, so that's one time where he spit on his finger, touched the guy's tongue. Another time that Jesus used saliva in Mark chapter 8, verse 23. Uh, it says, so he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of town. Again, they bring a blind man to Jesus. Let me get him away from all these people. And when he had spit on his eyes, so he spit on the man's eyes. I wish we'd go to a healing service today. And somebody come forward, and then the minister would spit on the man. We would not be happy. But if that's what God led him to do, see, we don't know any better. But he also made this be crazy. But Jesus wasn't crazy. So he spit on his eyes, and then he put his hands on him, and said, do you see anything? And he looked up, and he said, I see men like trees walking. His eyes was kind of fuzzy, right? The healing was coming. So then he, then he put his hands on, him, on his eyes again, and made him look up. So sometimes God may have you lay hands on somebody twice. Who knows? So, so we have these rules. No, I've already laid hands on you. I can't lay hands on you again. Why? Because you just made up that rule or did God say that? If God says only lay hands on them once, fine. But don't just make up a rule. Okay. Made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Again, this is like consistent with Jesus. There are people who are trying to get to me, and you keep telling everybody, the whole town. And so now there's this crowd around me, like people watching an accident, and then the, there's somebody who's trying to get to me who are going to have a hard time. Okay. So um, that's twice before this that he has spit on his finger, touched a man's tongue. And one time he just spit directly in the eyes. This time he spits in the dust and makes clay. Okay, so John chapter 8, again, we're, I mean 9, let me change that again. I'll be so confused later when I'm reading this. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So he spits and he makes in the ground and he makes this clay and he anoints the guy's eyes. Right, But first he spits on the ground, doesn't spit on his finger, doesn't spit in the guy's eyes. This is how God directs him, spit in the clay. I mean spit in the dust and he makes a clay. Now. What's another thing that's going on besides, like, here's a common remedy that you're used to that I'm going to add to Supernatural because this common remedy that you're used to has never been used in this way. You guys believe in saliva, healing wounds, but has it ever healed the blind man's eyes? So let me just take you one step to the next level. Why is he making dust from the clay of the earth? Where have we heard that before? Genesis chapter 2, verse 5. It says, before any plant of the field was on the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. Uh, so he's created the garden and, and God is narrating. This is before there's plants and trees and everywhere. It says, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. But there, and, and so there was no man to till the ground, right? Why? Unless there's somebody to till the ground, why am I going to have plants just running wild? Let me invent, let me invent, let me create man first, and then I will create the herbs and all that stuff, and he will till the ground. So, it says a mist went up from the earth, so a little light mist went up from the earth, and it watered the whole face of the ground. So, it's creating mud, right? There's just dirt everywhere, there's no greenery everywhere, just dirt. And a mist is coming up from the earth, and it's watering the ground, creating this mud. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that mud, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So he's creating man, he shapes him out of this dust and creates and informs him, and then breathes and man becomes a living soul. So Jesus is going to do the same thing. I want them, Jesus is saying, I want you, uh, oh, 
All right. So let me know. I see Susan, Jan, Rodney, and Donna. You're all. Let me know if you're watching me on Facebook. My wife's having trouble with Facebook, and it could just be our connection in our house, or it could be Facebook in general. So if you can comment, yes, I'm watching you on Facebook, or no, I'm not watching you on Facebook. I'm watching you on ebook. Okay, because she, she's just trying to get it onto Facebook. All right. Um, so he, he's, he's saying, I want you to think of the Bible. Jesus used every opportunity to remind them of the scriptures, to, to, to show them the scriptures, right? Because if they don't think he's the Messiah, they are going to perish in their sins and die and go to hell. So I'm going to take everything I can to remind them of the scriptures. So let me do this creative miracle. This man was born blind. We're going to create new eyes. So, so remember when God created man out of the dust? I'm going to do that and do this miracle and with his eyes. So what will that remind you of? That I'm God reaching out to man and see? Won't you think that I'm God? Okay. Here's the other interesting thing, though, that's going to come into play here, because when he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, uh, that's interesting why he picked that pick, pick a pool. So he's put mud on the guy's eyes. He's about to tell him to go wash off. I just want to finish reading here in Genesis. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 10 says, Now, a river went out of Eden to water the gar garden, right? Now the garden is actually starting to grow and trees are starting to grow. And something about the tree, we'll, we'll come back to that. And from there, it parted and became four river heads. So there's a river starts in Eden, and then it goes in four directions, north, south, east, and west. It describes where three of them goes, and then the fourth one, which goes toward the east. The name of the first is Pishon, is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there was gold. And the gold of that land is good. Then there's Bedlam, which is the onyx stones are there. And the name of the second river is Gihon. It is one which goes around the whole land of Cush, which goes south, right, toward Egypt and Africa. The name of the third river is Hiddekel. And it is one which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Okay, now the Euphrates uh, river is the one that separates Assyria from Israel. And, and whenever an enemy was going to come, the Bible always said, they'll come from the Euphrates. They'll come from the Euphrates. Okay, I'm looking to see. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Rodney says. Richard Gaines, I am using Facebook. So let's, let's just start connecting. Okay, so um, it is the one which goes toward the east. Of, uh, so Euphrates is, it's always saying the enemy will come from the east. They'll, they will cross the Euphrates. In fact, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, it says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. So there's, there's seven angels. They're each pouring out their bowls, right, of judgment. The sixth river poured out his bowl on the river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So the enemies is going to come. The, the villains are going to come, and they're going to cross the Euphrates. So there's the Euphrates River, that's the bad one. Then there's the good one, the River of Life. We're, we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so he's creating from the dust, and he's putting it on the eyes so that they'll think, oh, that reminds me of God creating man. And he says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. Why does it mean scent? Okay, because this the, a spring was rare, in Jerusalem at that time, right? Jerusalem's kind of in the desert. Um, there was a spring that came out from between Mount Moriah and Mount Zion. The temple is built on Mount Zion and right behind the temple, east of the temple, is Mount Moriah. So the, the temple's built on Mount Zion. East of that is Mount Moriah where Jesus is crucified. And there's a spring of water that comes in between them and then comes into Jerusalem. That's And that spring comes to a little pool, and they call that the Pool of Siloam, which means scent, uh, which is really the word used to be Shiloh, which is Shiloh means the scent one, meaning it's scent from God. And that was their idea, that like, this is scent from the mountain of God, and this water is sent to us. So go and wash in the pool from which where God has sent the healing water, because I want them to think about a couple things. 
uh, what I just told you a few months ago, when, when in John chapter 7, verse 37, when it says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. That's because they had just been going to the pool of Siloam uh, for this week-long festival that was taking place, the Feast of Tabernacles, and they would dip in the pool of Siloam, and they would come back to the temple, and they would pour water out. They'd pour water out every day. And then on the last day, Jesus said, if you thirst, I am, that's me, the pool of Siloam, that's me, that water, that's me. Come to me in thirst, because then, then out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. I'm the water of life. That's, this is all, everything the Bible is pointing to me. These aren't just interesting things God's had you to do. God is constantly painting pictures so you'll understand this Messiah, recognize him when he comes. So I want you to go to that pool of Siloam that I was just talking about earlier and go there and wash and, the, and, and, and receive life. Okay. So in Isaiah chapter 8, this is what he's hoping the Pharisees, his real mission is, is I've got to read some of these Pharisees. I have six months to reach the Pharisees and two months have already gone by. So he has this plan to reach the Pharisees. Now, here's, here's, he's really good. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. Um, Israel is about to get judged because the northern Israel, they're making, pl they're plan making plans with us, the king of Assyria. And God doesn't want them to do that. I'll protect you. Do not come in league with the king of Assyria because now you're saying with the king of Assyria is your protection instead of me. Don't make league with any of these other nations. Judah hasn't done it yet, but, but uh, north Israel, they're making that, yes, Assyria is going as our guy. Now, of course, Assyria joins with them and then eventually takes them over and takes them off into captivity and like, boy, we were stupid. So the Lord says in, in Isaiah chapter 8, it says, The Lord spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh, which is Sil Siloam, right? Shiloh and Siloam, it's the same word. It just kind of got changed a little bit. You refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly. And we so I've got water flowing into Jerusalem that you're refusing. That's me. That's what I've sent you. Instead, it says you rejoice in resin and Ramallah's son. So you're you're rejoicing in the king of of uh, Syria, of Assyria, and what was the other one? Samaria. Those, those are the two kings. You're rejoicing in them. You're trusting in them instead of trusting in me. So he says, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up. Over them, the waters of the river, Euphrates, is what he's talking about. Strong and mighty, the king of Assyria in all his glory, he will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. So that river that you're trusting in, Euphrates, that river is going to come and overflow because you're not trusting in the soft, gentle waters of Shiloh. So Jesus is saying to the guy, go wash in the pool of Shiloh so they'll remember because the same judgment that happened then, that Isaiah was warning them about. You, you, you're not trusting in me. And, and, and sure enough, they invaded Israel and they destroyed the temple. Jesus is saying the same thing is going to happen again. So I want you to go to the pool of Siloam because people are going to follow you there. In this case, I want a crowd to follow. I know it's about to happen. I'm doing this on purpose. I, I, I want you to, somebody's going to lead you there and somebody say, hey, th that guy told us to go pull some and the big crowds, and then you're going to be healed. And that hopefully will remind them of that scripture when, when I warned them way back in Isaiah that what you're doing is bad, you're not listening to me, and everything got destroyed. So this is Jesus on purpose, hoping that they get the message. Because again, he said it to them to their faces, right? I am that I am. I am the Messiah. I am, and you're the Father. He's already had this. We don't believe you. So let me do things from the Bible. Maybe they'll believe if they can't believe my words, which I keep telling them, you got to listen to my words. Please listen to my words. Don't listen to my words. Then maybe they'll see these signs then. Okay. In Isaiah chapter 11, so he talks about you, the, the waters of the Euphrates are going to overflow and the king of Syria is going to attack you. But I wish you were just, but I am going to bring a righteous branch out of that's going to grow a new tree, just like the tree in the Garden of Eden. There's the tree of life in the middle and it's got all these rivers around it. So this new river is going to flow and there's a new tree that's going to grow up, right? So once that's all wiped away, I'm going to bring from this tree my Messiah. He says in, in, in Isaiah chapter 11, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and the branch shall grow out of its roots, right? So he's saying, you're ignoring 
the pool of Siloam, the pool of Shiloh, but something's going to grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of the eyes, nor decide by the hearing of the ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. He shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Because in the previous chapter, Jesus kept saying, you're not listening to my words, you got to listen to my words. You're not listening to what I'm saying to you, and that's going to, that's going to judge you. My words are going to judge you. And he's again thinking, do you not read the Bible? Because I'm by quoting scripture to you. This should draw, I said, God said in Isaiah that he's going to bring his servant and this is what he's going to do. Why are you not listening? Uh, sure enough, back in Isaiah's time, uh, 100 years after Isaiah, the temple was destroyed. Everything that God prophesied happened. And they went back and they rebuilt the temple. In Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 15, they're re re and then they're rebuilding all the gates of Jerusalem, right, around the temple. It says, uh, Shalom, the son of Kol Jose, leader of the district of Mizpah, he repaired the fountain gate. That's the gate that the water flows back into Jerusalem from Mount Moriah. He says he, re he repaired the fountain gate. He built it. He covered it. He hung its doors with its bolts and bars, he repaired the wall of the pool of Shela, which is Shiloh, which they literally called Siloam, by the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. So they, they made sure that pool flowed. So Jesus is thinking if they've read the Bible, they know the importance of the pool of Siloam and that God's going to do miracles from that and that's going to be a sign and that's why they rebuilt it. And he said, I was going to build a tree of righteousness from the, out of the pool. So, let, so he sends them to the pool of Siloam on purpose. I need to do a miracle. A miracle needs to happen there. Uh, so he went and washed, John chapter 8, verse 7, and he came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? And some said, verse 9, this is he. And others said, well, he's like him, but this couldn't be him because he's not blind anymore. So how could this be him? But he said, no, I am he. It's me. I'm telling you. God did this miracle in front of everybody on the Sabbath. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 10. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? John chapter 8, verse 11. And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, so out of the dust, just like God created man, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? And he says, I do not know. Now, why did Jesus not go with him? Because Jesus knew what would happen. I need this man to be brought before the Pharisees because that's who I'm trying to reach. So I just gave the Pharisees a message in the previous chapter. Listen to these words. Listen to these signs. I'm telling you that you're of the father, you're devil, and you're not listening to me, but I'm from Father God. So now I know what's going to happen. I don't want this man to come back to me. I want him to go to the Pharisees. So it says, verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Please understand, which is nutty to me, they believe that you weren't supposed to use to make medicine on the Sabbath because, and a lot of religions teach this, it's the Sabbath day. Keeping it holy means don't do anything, and that's not what it means means don't you do anything that you come up with. Give one day that you're listening to God. God may have you do something. That's why Jesus says, you, you're going to pull your horse out of the ditch on the Sabbath. You're not going to let it just sit there all day. Why can't I heal somebody on the Sabbath? You would pull your horse out of the ditch on the Sabbath. Can I not rescue this person from the ditch that they're in on the Sabbath? And, and so we're supposed to be doing God's work, he said. Now, we have entered into a Sabbath where every day we're supposed to be doing God's work. But they didn't have the Spirit of God in them to tell them what to do like we do. So God says, take a day and listen, and I'll tell you what to do. We get to listen every day. But Jesus, because Jesus is now the Sabbath. Now, you know, anyway, enough of that. So on the Sabbath, he did it on purpose, where they didn't believe you're supposed to make medicine because that's work. 
So you, he made medicine on the Sabbath. And of course, they made that up. There's nothing in the Bible that says don't make medicine. It just says keep it holy, keep it belonging to God. The Sabbath, the seventh day is the Lord, so do whatever he tells you to do. Okay, so it says they brought him uh, who was only blind to the Pharisees, and that was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked, also asked them again, how had he received his sight? And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. So it was that simple. He took the dust of the earth, he put it in the light. I washed in it. And, and I'm just, I'm pointing this out because Jesus could have done it other ways. He's doing this on purpose because he knows this man is going to be brought to the Pharisees. The other guys, other blind, they were not brought to the Pharisees. I'm trying to get a sign to them. They're the last people. All through Samaria, they are following me around. All up in Galilee, all of my disciples are from Galilee. So again, just reminding you, Israel divided into thirds, right? Northern, central, southern, just like California. Northern, central, southern. All the north, they're totally believing. They're all from Galilee. That's what the disciples are. All Samaria, revival happened in Samaria because of the woman at the well. Down in Jerusalem, they are not feeling it. So this is like, I really got to focus, especially on these Pharisees, finding ways to reach them. So this man's going to be sent. He's going to be brought from the Pharisees. They're going to ask him, how is it that you see? He says, I, I put, he put clay and I watch and I see. Now, Isaiah, so they're supposed to be thinking about, because the pool of Siloam is only mentioned like a couple times in scripture, period. So when they, he sent you, because it's called sent, Siloam means sent, sent from God. He sent you to the pool of Siloam? Yes. Well, there's only one other scripture where that is, that should make them think about Isaiah. In Isaiah, uh, chapter 35, verse 4, it says, Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Two things are going to happen. And, and, and remember the first day Jesus went to the temple and he opened up the book. The first time he's in Jerusalem and says, I've come to anoint the eyes of the, I've come to do all these miracles and also the day of vengeance. Except he didn't read the day of vengeance part. He, 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 he stopped right before that sentence and said, the spirit of the Lord of God is on me because he's anointed me. But they know that the next thing is to bring the day of vengeance. And we don't understand that Jesus came. He was doing both at the same time. I'm coming to bring healing to all those who will listen and consequences and judgment to those who won't. Because this is the turning point. I am the turning point. I'm here, and this is what's going to be a judgment day. I'm the turning point. If you believe in me, you go left. If you don't, you go right. Whatever, you know. And so he's saying to the Pharisees, I am the turning point. If you believe, you'll be saved. If not, you will be judged. And even in the scripture, behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense of God, but he will come and save you who believe. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. So I sent this man to a Siloam that's called, place that's called sent, that we believe was sent from God, and opened his eyes so that you go, wow, his eyes were opened. The blind man's eyes were open. I wonder if this is a sign. What if this means something? Isaiah chapter 42, verse uh, 5. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. This is God talking to his servant, Jesus. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. You're, you're the new covenant I'm giving to the people. As a light to the nations, to the Gentiles. To open blind eyes. To bring out prisoners from the prison. Those who sit in darkness from the prison house. So that's what you will open blind eyes and those who've been in darkness, you'll bring them right out into the light. That's why Jesus says, I am the light. I've got to work while it's day because the darkness is coming when nobody can work. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I will not give to another. And Jesus is going to argue this later. When have you ever seen blinded eyes open? This is not, because they're going to say, that's the devil. And God's going to say, no. I open blind eyes. I won't give my, I won't allow anybody else to open blind eyes, but other than somebody who's sent by me. So don't, the devil can't imitate God in the way we give God the devil credit. We just get, you know, bless his holy name. The devil's working, the devil show is busy. And we'll just talk about the devil so much. And God's like, you've given the devil too much credit. So at this point, they're about to give 
the devil credit for what God did, even though he says, again, it's, about, it's like, don't you read the scriptures? But then I say that all the time to a lot of people. Do you not read the Bible? Okay, so he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I'm declaring. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So God is saying, I'm, the reason why I'm, tell, I'm telling you these things in advance so that when they happen, you'll go, oh, this must be God because this is exactly what he's spoken of. So I'm telling you, you before they happen, I tell them so that you'll recognize them. So Jesus is now coming saying, I'm the fulfillment of everything Isaiah was talking about, everything that Jeremiah was talking about, everything Ezekiel was talking about, all the Old Testament prophets, Micah, uh, I don't know why I'm like going to name every single one. You know who I'm talking about. All the Old Testament prophecies, Jesus says, I am the fulfillment. It's happening now in your ears, in your hearing. Please believe it. I'm, I'm, I know that this man's going to come before you, and you're going to see a blind man whose eyes are open. Those other blind men, I didn't let you hear. See, you, you, I mean, not that he stopped it, but those happened up north. Those happened in the central area, and those towns saw it. But this one I'm doing on purpose on the Sabbath, just because that's going to bug you. He's going to be brought before you, and you're going to have the opportunity to say, wow, I believe. And, and this is just a metaphor for all of those who will come before God. They, they will have enough proof. We don't have to worry about it. They will have enough proof, and God will judge them on how they responded to it. They either will want to believe or not want to believe. See a blinded man's eyes open and say, well, that's the devil. You don't want to believe. You're Pharaoh versus Moses. I just don't want, I don't care. You can bring all these plagues. You did, I don't want to believe. And those people, people who insist on going to hell, will go to hell. No one will go to hell by mistake. No one will go, oh, I didn't know. All right, God's not that kind of way. Well, you never said the word Jesus, so you're going to hell. That, that God's not trying to trap people or trick them into hell. Only people who are going to hell will be like the Pharisees who will know the truth and reject it. You have to reject the truth. So there's a lot of things we're worried about with, well, what about the man on the island? And the, God's not trying to send that person to hell. People will go to hell because they are insisting on it. And that's what the Pharisees did. I brought a blind man before you on the Sabbath, sent him to the place called Sent with the waters coming from Shiloh and still, Pool of Siloam and Shiloh, Siloam, and still you just refused. And so he'll, so his words will get pretty heated as we go through chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, and you'll see why. That he's really trying to reach them. Some will be reached, and some will deserve the faith that's coming. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you again for listening in and, and, and letting me know that you were hearing. Hopefully you're still hearing. And I will... Uh, on Sunday, uh, we'll be preaching from the book. I'll be teaching from the book of Exodus. I also think I am preaching again on Sunday um, from Samuel chapter four. Next Wednesday and the next, I may the may be on the air a little earlier, so don't let that freak you out. At seven, it will already be there, possibly next week, but for sure the the, the following week. Uh, it'll already be there for you to see. So at 7, you can are going to do it at 5 or whatever time. You know, it's going to be there. But I, I'll be speaking earlier in the day. I'm not exactly sure what time. But for the next two Wednesdays, next two Wednesdays I may have to be speaking earlier. Uh, so I'm just preparing. You. <laughs> so you may not get a notification. Or you may get a notification at, you know, at 3 o'clock or something. Uh, but don't worry. If 7 o'clock is your time, just tune in at 7. And feel free to comment because I will see your comments. Uh, later that evening. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in, and, and I uh, hope you uh, received something from the lesson. And I will, if I can figure out how to get my screen up, I'll be signing off. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.